welcome all of you on behalf of the Dr. Lee Dexam uh, uh, Research Center for Regenerative Medicine um, to this uh, fourth uh, Dr. Lee, uh, Lee Dexam uh, lecture, which is the um, uh, annual signature event of um, the center. And uh, this year we're uh, uh, very pleased to um, be able to um, have um, um, uh, Dr. Robert um, Langer uh, as our speaker. Uh, we will have um, our Vice President of Research, um, uh, Professor Max Shen, to introduce to him, uh, to, to, to you. Um, I will not uh, spend uh, too much time uh, on this. Uh, suffice to say that uh, the disruptions of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, mean that um, we are unable to have it um, in person, uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Langer has kindly agreed to do it on Zoom and we have uh, over uh, 540 uh, participants registered and uh, right now uh, more than 300 has uh, uh, joined the, uh, the site already and we expect that uh, this to uh, to keep uh, increasing uh, for the next five, 10 minutes. Um, and since all of you are here to listen to uh, Bob and uh, to interact with him uh, uh, at Q&A afterwards, uh, I will um, pass it to uh, uh, Professor um, Max Shen to introduce uh, our speaker. And, uh, if, and, and just before that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the thanks of uh, Wei Ping, our PI, uh, who's been instrumental in um, inviting uh, Dr. Langer to the, um, uh, the lecture. Uh, and without further ado, uh, I'll pass on uh, the uh, podium to, uh, to Max, please. Thank you, Paul. Um, good evening, Robert. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody here. Um, welcome to the Dr. Li Da Sam uh, lecture. We are really delighted and honored to have Professor Robert Langer here today to deliver this year's lecture, which is, I believe, the fourth uh, in this series. Thank you all for joining us remotely today. Uh, first of all, I really would like to express our sincere appreciation for Dr. Li and his family for supporting our research and making today's seminar possible. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic presents a once in a generation challenge to medical researchers. During these difficult times, Hong Kong Yu and its teams of scientists have played a vital role in improving our understanding of the virus, as well as providing the research necessary to fight it properly. Now with the release of several types of uh, vaccines, we finally see some light at the end of the tunnel. One particular type of vaccine, the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna have drawn new attention to macro and nanotechnologies. Uh, nanoparticles, a uh, uh, vital component of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines play a really important role in protecting and delivering the mRNA effectively to where uh, they are needed in cells. So here at the Dr. Li Da Sam Research Center, we actually have uh, labs focusing on using nanotechnology for the e efficient delivery of various uh, ther therapeutics. Also our speaker today, uh, one of the world leading experts uh, on this subject, uh, Robert from MIT, um, who is actually also the academic co-founder of Moderna, will speak to us about macro and nanotechnologies in drug delivery. So now uh, allow me to use the next uh, few minutes to introduce uh, Robert. He has achieved so much uh, in his career that it's impossible for me even to read out all, all of them in, in my five minutes introduction. So I'll just briefly mention a few um, very important ones. Uh, so described by uh, the Phoebe magazine as the Edison, uh, uh, Edison of medicine, uh, Albert has re received more than 220 
major academic awards. Uh, this is really uh, even, I'm not sure where you put all this uh, award at your home, Robert. Um, he's also a, a, an institute professor at MIT. This is a, a, the greatest honor any professor can get for MIT. Uh, there are only 10 institute professors at MIT. One of my collaborator and, and friend, uh, Tom McNenty was one of those. I know how, how big a figure he is in, in my own research area. Um, Robert has published more than 1,500 articles and uh, have citation over uh, 332,000 times. So his, his, his age index is 285. This is the highest of any engineer in history and tied for the fourth highest of any individual in any research field. Uh, not only for publication and research and all that, he also have over 1,400 patents, uh, licensed to more than 400 companies. So he has been really active, not only in, uh, in, in academic work, but also in uh, applying his research to uh, real world. Uh, lastly, I want to mention that he is one of only three living individuals to have received both the US National Medal of Science and the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. So on behalf of the university, I would like to extend a really warm welcome to uh, Robert Langer. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Langer. Thank you. Back to you. Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really an honor to be able to deliver this lecture. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I got into this field and then tell you about some of the work that we are doing. So I'm a chemical engineer, as was mentioned, and I got my degree in 1974 at MIT in chemical engineering. And pretty much all my friends went into the oil industry, but I wasn't excited about that. Uh, I, I, I wanted to see if I could do something with my career that would help people. And, and, and I started to try to get jobs in education, but nobody would hire me. And then I would try to get jobs in medicine. And actually nobody would hire me there either. Uh, they wouldn't even write back. But one day, one of the people uh, that I was talking to in the lab where I was said to me, Bob, you should write to a surgeon named Judah Folkman. He said, sometimes he hires unusual people. He thought very highly of Dr. Folkman. I won't say what he thought about me. But at any rate, I wrote to Dr. Folkman and he offered me a job at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And I was the only engineer working there. Now, Dr. Folkman had an idea and this idea is shown on the next slide. His idea was that if you could stop blood vessels from growing in the body, that might be an entirely new way of stopping tumors from growing. Now, this slide is a picture from the, in the New York Times depicting his idea. So if you look in the bottom left of the screen, the idea is that the tumor cell somehow becomes abnormal. And then as you look at the arrows, it grows bigger and bigger. And when you get to the middle part of the screen, the lower middle part, it's about a million cells. But then it runs into what's called the nutrition problem. Cells in the center can't get nutrients or get rid of waste. So it would not get larger than that millimeter cubed except for one thing, that his idea was that the tumor cells made a substance, which he called TAF or tumor angiogenesis factor. And that diffused to the surrounding blood vessels, which normally didn't do anything. But now in the presence of this substance, they would start growing and forming new capillaries and growing to the tumor. And that would then cause, as you move up with the arrows, to the upper right part, hand part of the screen, the tumor has solved its nutrition problem because the blood vessels bring in the nutrients. And the tumor now fed by the blood vessels gets bigger and bigger. And if you go to the uppermost part of the screen, uh, you see that it's highly vascularized. And of course the tumor can spread through those blood vessels. That's a process called metastasis, which is what often kills people. So his idea was that if you could stop those vessels from growing, achieve anti-angiogenesis, that might be a whole new kind of therapy. Now, this was an idea and, and, and yet 
uh, people uh, were very skeptical of it. And my job was to prove he was right. And in so doing, isolate the first substances that could stop blood vessels from growing. Now, the thing is, is whenever you have a problem like that, to find it a new factor, you have to have what's called a bioassay. And in our case, you needed a bioassay to study blood vessels. And there was no such thing. There was no way to study blood vessels. So Dr. Folkman and I had to invent one. And what we decided to try to invent is shown on the next slide. Our idea was that if you put certain types of tumors in the eye of a rabbit, the eye of the rabbit normally has no blood vessels. Um, also, it's pretty big, so you can see it through an ophthalmic microscope. But if you put certain types of tumors in the eye, like a V2 carcinoma, it will cause blood vessels to grow from the edge of the cornea at the bottom. It'll grow from the edge of the cornea to the tumor. Takes some time, takes a number of weeks. So what we needed was some way to deliver um, like a polymer or something like that through a micro or nanoparticle that you could put in the eye that would deliver whatever substances we were isolating. Now, the thing is all the substances we were isolating were large molecules uh, like peptides, proteins, or nucleic acids. So we needed something that the large molecules could be put in in an active form and then delivered over a period of time. Now, Dr. Folkman, he was on the board of the only company in the world that was working on any type of drug delivery. And he went there and he asked them, uh, could they help us? And they had Nobel Prize winners like Paul Flory on their board. Uh, and, he, and, and, and he asked them and they all said, well, no, uh, if we go to the next slide, you can't do this. Uh, you, large molecules can't diffuse through solid materials any more than any of us could walk through a, a brick wall. The literature actually said the same thing. Next slide. The literature said the use of polymer matrices for slow release systems has been virtually restricted to small molecules. So the only thing I maybe had going for me is I hadn't read any of that. So we tried anyhow. And I spent several years working in the laboratory, experimenting with different techniques. I actually found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. But eventually I, I was able to get something that worked. And the next slide shows a picture of that. On the left, you see a microsphere. And on the right, you see a cut in half. And what we discovered is that you could, with the right design, the right polymer or lipid or uh, and the right design, what you could do is deliver pretty much any molecule in active form. Next slide. This is from a paper we wrote in Nature in 1976. And here you see different large molecules, marker molecules being released. Also, this paper represents the first time that anyone put a nucleic acid in, in a microparticle or nanoparticle and showed that it could be come that it could be active and, and come out. Um, nucleic acids are RNA or DNA. So anyhow, we published all this in, in the in its nature. And then that same year, I got asked for the first time to give a lecture at a major material science meeting in Michigan. And I gave this 20 minute talk and I thought I actually did all right. I was 27 years old the age of many of you perhaps now. And I gave this talk and at the end of it, I thought, you know, I did all right. I didn't forget too much of what I was gonna say. I didn't stammer too much. So I thought when I was done with this talk, all these older scientists being nice people would, would wanna encourage me, this young guy. But when I got done, I stepped off the podium and a whole bunch of them came up to me and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. They said, next slide, that, this couldn't be true because as was mentioned before, large molecules can't diffuse through solid materials. They also said that the organic solvents we were using to make these, manufacture these, they'll destroy peptides or proteins or nucleic acids. So, so that was very discouraging. And actually things even went downhill from there. 
I, I tried to get research grants to support the work, but my first nine were rejected. People just said chemical engineers can't do this kind of work. And then I, um, I actually liked being a postdoc, but a lot of the people in the lab where I was said, it's not a good idea to be a postdoc forever. So I started applying for faculty positions. And of course, since I'm a chemical engineer, I applied to chemical engineering departments, but no chemical engineering department in the country would hire me. They all said that this didn't make any sense what I was doing and that chemical engineers, you know, don't do biological work. This was 1976. So I didn't get a job, but it turned out that uh, one of the people that was in the nutrition department, the head of that nutrition department, at MIT, he knew my boss, Dr. Folkman, and he met me and he liked me. So, uh, uh, but he was the kind of department head uh, who was what I'll call more of like a benevolent dictator. So he liked me and he offered me the job, but he didn't bother to ask anybody else in the department what they thought, which, which probably still might've been okay, except for one thing. And that is the year after I joined that department, he left. Um, so a lot of the senior faculty decided to give me advice and their advice is I, I should leave too. In fact, next slide, uh, this is from one of my good friends, Mike Marletta, who later became chairman of Berkeley's chemistry department and a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. And Mike was talking about what it was like to be with me. He was doing this talk in 2014, but he was talking what it was like to be with me in 1980. And he said, one evening, he went to a faculty dinner at a Chinese restaurant with me and some senior MIT professors. He said a senior scientist sat quizzing us while smoking a cigar. He said, when the older scientists heard my concepts for drug delivery, he blew a cloud of smoke in my face and said, you better start looking for another job. So that was very discouraging, but I, I kept working at it. And, you know, and we kept making progress. Um, I'm, I'm still at MIT, so I guess it, it, it was okay. But, um, at, but we kept making progress and we were able then to use these techniques that I developed to try to solve the angiogenesis problem. And the next slide is just a repeat of what you saw earlier. This is uh, published in Science in 1976 also. And this is the bioassay we developed. But what we did is I had isolated maybe a hundred different fractions different macromolecules. We put them all in these polymer vehicles and we literally did something like 2000 rabbit eyes. I'm gonna show you a picture on the next slide, but before I do, I wanna give you a warning. Well, I guess it's, it's up, so it's okay. So basically what happened is almost everything we used, every fraction we isolated did not work. Uh, and if you look on the left-hand side, you see an example of what happens that Several weeks after the after you put uh, the tumor in and, and the drug delivery system in, you see the sheet of blood vessels growing in the eye. And if you looked at this eye just a couple of weeks later, it would be three dimensional. It'd be out of the orbit of the eye. It would actually kill. But if you look on the right hand side, this was really exciting. The one fraction, one fraction. We repeated this experiment 21 times, and every time you saw something like you saw on the right-hand side. Whereas we probably close to 2000 times, we saw what you did on the left. So at any rate, with the controls. So on the right-hand side, notice how low, lower the blood vessels are, they're sparser, they avoid the uh, drug delivery vehicle. And what was really amazing is 60% of the time, these tumors never became three-dimensional. Whereas 100% of the time, and that's in thousands of eyes, and historically tens of thousands that Dr. Folkman had done, they always became three-dimensional. Uh, they're, they're always, animals are sacrificed before they kill. That was a 1976 paper. Nonetheless, it took another 28 years from that paper and really terrific work by Genentech and other companies and billions of dollars being spent before, before the first angiogenesis inhibitor was approved by FDA. And the next slide shows something that I think is very significant, that starting 28 years later, using actually some of the techniques we developed, what you see is one after the next, after the next angiogenesis inhibitor being approved for clinical use. 
by FDA or other places. Avastin, the first of these, also the last of these is, 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 is right now, uh, is probably the number two largest selling biotech drug in history. And, but there are many others that have been approved for all kinds of cancers. And now quite a few drugs are approved based on angiogenesis inhibition for eye diseases like macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. These are drugs like uh, ILEA or Lucentis. All of these are what are called blockbusters, uh, multi-billion dollar drugs. So, so this was very exciting to see that these got approved and they're being used by many millions of people all over the world. So Dr. Folkman uh, once said to me, said, Bob, um, you know, we, we should uh, uh, file a patent on the drug delivery work. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so we did, but, um, and interestingly, it was the first patent in the history of Boston Children's Hospital. But five years in a row, the patent examiner rejected. It. He didn't think it made any sense, so he kept rejecting it. So the head of the technology transfer office at the hospital came to see me one day and said, Bob, you have to stop. He's never going to allow this patent. Please give up. But, but I don't like to give up. So I started to think, how could we convince the patent examiner to allow this patent, you know, legally, of course, and, and science really wasn't working. But as I told you earlier, when we first started doing this, everyone told me it was impossible, it could never work. So I wondered, maybe somebody wrote that down. So what we did is what's called the science citation search. So I did this in 1982, looking back at our 1976 Nature paper to see who wrote about it. And I found many articles, it's been cited well over a thousand times now, but I found many articles. And uh, one was actually very important in terms of a patent. Next slide. This was from five of the top material scientists in the world. And they're describing this field of drug delivery in 1979. And what, what they did is they actually referred back to that nature paper uh, that we did. And they're just describing the field. They said, generally the agent to be released is a relatively small molecule with a molecular weight no larger than a few hundred. One would not expect that macromolecules, for example, proteins, could be released by such a technique because of their extremely small permeation rates. However, Folkman and myself have reported some surprising, so surprising is a really good word for a patent examiner, some surprising results that clearly demonstrate the opposite. So I showed this to the head of the tech transfer office at Children's Hospital, and he flew down to show it to the patent examiner and the patent examiner said, I had no idea. He said, I tell you what, I will allow this patent if Dr. Langer can get written affidavits from each of these five people that they really wrote this. So as a young professor, I wrote them all and each of them was nice enough to write me back that they really did write it. And then we got a very broad patent, next slide. And, uh, and, and really on any macromolecule. And with that, next slide, I got involved in uh, starting companies. I got, we got involved in licensing things to companies and teaching things to companies. And today there are millions of products all over the world uh, that people are using. Uh, I mean, there are, for example, if somebody has prostate cancer, there's uh, luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone uh, analogs that they wanna use to treat them, but they're big, they're peptides. And if you try to take orally take them or nasally take them, none gets in. If you inject them, that works, but it's destroyed in less than a minute. So you have to have ways to put them in like little microparticles, inject them underneath the skin, and then they'll deliver the drug uh, for whatever period of time you need. And there are many others. These are pictures up there of various microparticles, stents, other things that uh, can treat cancer, heart disease, pain medication, opioid addiction, eye diseases, and so on, schizophrenia. So, so these are used again, probably by hundreds of millions of people every year. But all these systems, you're still injecting underneath the skin, what's called subcutaneously or intramuscularly. I also wanted to be able to uh, inject into the bloodstream or into the muscle and, and have targeted therapies. But next slide. So there have been some targeted therapies, but you don't get much payload. Most of them are single molecules. 
But if you put something in a nanoparticle, then you could have much greater payload, like a thousand to maybe even a hundred thousand molecules. So back in the early nineties, Roxandra Graf, who was working with me and Vladimir Torchel and who had worked in this area, we put up a wish list. Next slide. Of all the things we wanted in the nanoparticles. And it's high encapsulation amount, high encapsulation efficiency, um, which means you don't lose much, that you could freeze dry them, that they don't stick together, that they degrade, that they're tiny, so they'll be taken up by the cells. And finally, that they're not cleared right away. And the idea that we put forth, next slide, um, was to make certain nanoparticles with polyethylene glycol. That would prevent the rapid clear clearance because polyethylene glycol uh, would attract a lot of water and the body has a lot of water, so it doesn't really recognize it and it wouldn't get destroyed right away. So we figured out a way to manufacture these. And the next slide just shows that they are nanoparticles. But the next slide is very exciting because it shows that if you put an orange dye in the nanoparticles and don't put the peg in on the upper left, the, in an hour, even in vitro, the cells eat them. But when you put peg on with different chain lengths or even triple chain, this is some chemistry that Avi Dome, uh, when he was with us developed, you get hardly any orange, you know, orange particles taken up, but with the triple chain, you get none at all. So now we had a way to make particles last a long time. And Omid Farrakh and Azad joined our lab, and next slide. And he worked out ways to put targeting molecules on it. Now I realize I probably may not have explained this all that well. So I'm very lucky that a number of years ago, Nova, the TV show, they came, and it's on what's called public broadcasting company in the US. They did a, a video of what we did. And I thought I'd put that on next slider video. He starts with a nanoparticle of anti-cancer drug. That gets encased in a plastic that releases the drug over time. That in turn gets a special wrapping that disguises the package as a water molecule to fool the body's immune system. And last but not least, the address where it should be delivered, a key that will only fit the lock of cancer cells. So we thought you could use this kind of approach uh, with polymers or lipids to put small molecules in. And of course, what's really exciting and was alluded to in the introduction for me is that you could even use it for possibly someday gene therapy to deliver siRNA or messenger RNA. And today, just to give you some uh, uh, highlights, uh, if you use polymer nanoparticles, next slide, we have uh, uh, many in clinical trials, aurora kinase inhibitors, uh, different anti-cancer drugs, even uh, new treatments for gout. Uh, at, but what we also thought is not only should we be able to do this with polymers, we should be able to do it lipids too. So now Dan Anderson, a postdoc in my lab, now a full professor at MIT, we put another wish list together. Next slide. And here what we thought is when we started this, there were only about 40 lipids that people had ever used for making lipid nanoparticles or what are called liposomes. We wanted to make thousands so that we could find some that were really good. And the wish list involved a high throughput parallel synthesis, enormous chemical diversity, very few steps, no protection or deep protection, no catalysts, no solvent switches, no purification and so forth. So next slide, what we did is we took all these different uh, uh, mo molecules, very large variations in R groups, which you can see here. Uh, next slide. And not only do we vary the R, R groups, we vary the tail lengths uh, on the left and the number of tails on the right, for example, five and four and three. And we made uh, different ones. The next slide just shows uh, an example where we could do, uh, even in vivo studies, showing that if you uh, wanted to uh, knock down factor seven in an animal, we did this with l -nylum. I was on the founding scientific advisory board of l -nylum, uh, you know, for, and, and, I was, and, and this was just a test we did. They also hired one of my 
very good graduate students of Kenneth Kink, and he's actually led all this. He's now a senior vice president. And what you see is oh, that you can get, uh, uh, get, get some results for close to 30 days. And you can actually even get, as shown on the next slide, um, you get a dose response curve. If you start looking at the factor seven uh, knockdown, uh, what you'll see is increasing it from 1.25 to 10 milligrams, you get increased knockdown. Whereas if you look at PBS or, or, or other controls, there's no knockdown at all. Next slide. And, and this just shows an example, like let's say you wanted to treat people who are hypercholesterolemic someday. What you could do is you could have an siRNA against uh, ApoB. And what you can see is if you go to the, the, the farthest right, that basically you can get um, you know, 40, 50% knockdown at 6.25 mg per kg uh, for uh, LDL, cholesterol. So that was, of course, in animals. And, 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 and when we do this, it's actually fully reversible. The next slide uh, just shows uh, liver knockdown with factor seven, and you can give the dose once a month, and it's, you can keep doing this for the rest of the animal's life, or as I'll go over the rest of the patient's life. And, and yet we wanted to keep on doing better and better. There have really been two challenges, I think, in, uh, in developing these nanoparticles for RNA therapies. One is, is giving less and less siRNA because there could be side effects. The other is targeted. But, so what we kept doing is, uh, uh, is, is that what we kept doing is, uh, is making improved lipid libraries. And uh, if we go to the next slide, what we, we did is we took uh, um, the best lipids that we, could, that we already had and we use them as a starting point for new libraries. And now we, and now we used uh, epoxide chemistry and we've created a whole new series of lipids uh, using these epoxides. And first we would test them in vitro. And the next slide just shows um, that if you look at the earlier lipid nanoparticles, um, we could go and get significant knockdown uh, with six mg per kg. But now if we go to what this one, which we call C12200, we get uh, actually some knockdown even at 0.003 mg per kg. So really, really low amounts. And over about a 10 year period between our lab and El Nylum, we worked together. They licensed our patents and gave us a substantial grant. Uh, we were able to uh, make this uh, more and more potent. And the next slide just shows uh, what was done. Uh, Basically, uh, here you're knocked down. You're knocking down uh, trans thiothreatine, and this is a non-human primates. And you can see that uh, when you do this, um, you get very significant knockdown in these primates. And 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 then if you look at at uh, what happened over this ten-year period in terms of potency, let's go to the next slide. And this is kind of a busy slide, but if you look on the right, what you see is where it started in say 2004. And you get, if you go all the way to the right, uh, what you see is um, you go to about 10 mg per kg. But if you go um, over time, we kept doing better between our own work and what we did with El Nylum. Um, you know, we have MIT papers and El Nylum papers. In fact, I noticed that uh, Yizu Dong gave a lecture to you uh, uh, in the series, and he actually got the most potent one. So he was actually able to go four to five orders of magnitude um, with, the, with the lipid nanoparticles he designed. But the point is, is that what, what, what we were able to do is get hugely improved uh, efficacy. So, and, and what this has all led to, not only our work, but uh, which, which enabled some of these things, but, but other work from, uh, you know, from different companies in Canada and P Peter Cullis working also with El Nylum, what, let, what that all led to is next slide, um, which is uh, really the first siRNA drug approved by F FDA. And basically what was done is you use a lipid nanoparticle and you have a, you put polyethylene glycol on it, like I mentioned, 
and, and, and you have a targeting molecule, which is galnac. This is a sugar that targets the liver. But this, uh, is for, this treatment is for a rare disease and uh, that people get. Uh, it can cause nerve damage and other problems. But the, the important point is this is now used. It's injected intravenously. It goes to the liver. And it, you get like 80 or 90% knockdown. So this was the first time uh, there was an approval for an RNA drug. Now also, uh, it was mentioned in my introduction, is in 2010, um, I, I also helped start another company. And that company was Moderna. And with Moderna, we thought um, what we can maybe do, this was with Derek Rossi and, and Nubar Fayan and Ken Chen, is that what we thought we could do is uh, create um, messenger RNA uh, drugs. And several types, I mean, we could again use this to treat rare diseases, intracellular diseases. We could also use it to treat big vaccines. And Moderna, you know, we uh, uh, hired some great people. Uh, and in, as people may know, in, uh, in 2020, um, what happened is we have uh, probably at that time, even 13 different drugs and vaccines in clinical trials. And then the COVID crisis came along. But the beauty of, of messenger RNA is twofold. One, right now, the major treatments for most large molecules involve protein therapies. But it may take a year or two to make that protein because you need a giant manufacturing plant and so forth. Uh, and if you're doing vaccines, you might need to grow eggs, uh, you know, which creates a large volume that takes, you know, for flu and may take, you know, a year or two. The beauty of messenger RNA is you can do the same thing in a couple of weeks. Why? Because the central dogma is DNA makes RNA make protein. So if you had messenger RNA and you put it in a nanoparticle, inject it into the body, you know, then it goes into the cell. And once it's in the cell, it starts making, uh, you know, the RNA starts making protein. And so rather than have this big egg factory or big plant, you just need the body and the body keeps making the protein or the vaccine, whatever it is that you want. So we did, we did that in Moderna. We started working on this uh, early in uh, 2020 uh, and uh, first clinical trials were started within less than two months later. And uh, we were the first company to be in clinical trials for the COVID vaccine. And then, you know, we broke the code uh, in the phase three trials at the end of the year, you know, it was uh, between 94 and 95 percent efficient. By the way, Pfizer did something working with BioNTech uh, similar, again, using nanoparticles with polyethylene glycol in them. But this has, uh, I think, been fundamental in hopefully uh, seeing the end of the tunnel for, uh, the, for COVID, at least I hope. It was certainly making a big dent in it. So I thought I'd tell you about a couple of other things we were involved in. Uh, next slide. You know, so one of the things that uh, Klaus Jensen, who was one of my colleagues and I wrote a grant on is could we actually insert things into cells? And people are already trying that. Of course, they're using techniques like electroporation, cell penetrating peptides, nanoparticles. If you could just press the button, please, twice. Well, so what you see is each of these work, but they also cause problems. You can insert things into cells, but you could get damage to the payload, chemical modification, off-target effects. So one of the things that Klaus and I did is we wrote a grant to study this. And we got a very good graduate student, Armin Shari. And Armin uh, started studying this. Now, Klaus, my, co my collaborator, he does a lot of things with microfluidics. So we created a little chamber where we would put a single cell through, uh, uh, you know, a, a microfluidic system. And then when it got to a certain point where we made a constriction, we actually shot a gene gun uh, there. And the next slide just shows a video of this. If we could press the button, you see the cell moving through. Now you see the constricted pore. Where that pore is, is the gene gun. See the cell, the constricted pore. So, so this is what happens. Now, one, and, and you know, Armin was getting results. And then one day he just decided for a control sort of, he's gonna take the gene gun away and see what happens. And it's amazing, he got exactly the same result. You didn't need the gene gun to get genes in. Why is that? Well, clearly the constricted pore did that 
It must do it by squeezing the cell. So what we started to build, next slide, is um, a whole system to squeeze cells. And, and you could do a million cells. Now we have a company where we do 10 billion cells a second. Um, and, and, and almost everything we put in, we've tested 30 different things. And you can even put quantum dots in. We've done this, it would work with every mammalian cell. It doesn't work with plant cells, interestingly. But basically this is what happens. And just to give you one proof of principle that Armin did, next slide, is that we took the Yamanaka factors uh, and reprogrammed uh, human fibroblasts uh, with them different ways. First, allowing them to enter with cell penetrating peptides. And yet here we only got two colonies. Then if you use nucleofection, which is electroporation basically, you got 11. But if we took the device that Armin made, he got 150. So this clearly was the most effective way. And, and um, so what happened was in 2014, Scientific American came out with their uh, top 10 world changing ideas. Um, and what you could see is CRISPR-Cas9 came in first, but the squeeze approach came in second. I, I felt they had the order wrong, but you know, CRISPR is pretty good. So I think that was fine. And, and also not only was it effective, it was also we had got better cell survival, but what was particularly interesting, next slide, is that compared to the gold standard, when people uh, put things into cells, they use electroporation. So if you look at a transcriptome, which is the messenger RNA profile, if you compare the controls to the electroporated system, you see a huge change. Whereas when you squeeze it, there's much less change. And this is actually the mildest electroporation that could be done. So Armin uh, actually is now, we started this company called Squeeze. Armin is the CEO of the company. It's actually already a public company with over hundred employees uh, and in clinical trials to treat, to, you know, where we've engineered cells to treat different kinds of cancer. So I thought I'd, I'd, I'd end perhaps on, on one last point, which is uh, of micro and nanotechnology, which is I once had this idea, I was watching a TV show on how they made microchips in the computer industry. And I thought to myself, gee, wouldn't that be a great way to do drug delivery? Now, if you spent your whole life doing drug delivery, maybe you'd think that about uh, any TV show. So, uh, so at any rate, I mentioned this to Michael Sima, one of my colleagues, and we created with John Santini, our graduate student, these tiny little microchips shown in the next slide. Now, this is a cutaway and they're wells with, that have active substance in them and they can be covered with gold or platinum alloys. And they'll stay like this literally for years. The next slide just shows a picture of one of them. On the top, you see uh, a top view of one that's got 34 wells. Next to it's the bottom view, also 34 wells. And uh, th this is like a short flat ship. They, as I'll show you, they can be any size and shape. But next to it, we put the smallest United States coin uh, on it, a dime. And, uh, and so this is like I say, a short flat chip. Now we have chips that have 400 wells in the same amount. At any rate, we published in the journal Nature, next slide, that you could do this. You could take uh, scanning electron micrographs of wells, which you see here, and they'll stay like this essentially forever. But if you apply just one volt, what happens in nanoseconds is shown in the next slide. The basically the cover just comes off. And when it does, next slide, you get drug coming out. Here we arbitrarily triggered drug release of a single marker molecule, fluorescein, at different times. But you could literally have a pharmacy on a chip. Next slide. And what you could do is have multiple drugs come out whenever you want it. Now this is in vitro, but we don't, we ultimately want to use these in people. So uh, John started a company and uh, we took this into animals like dogs and then into people. Next slide. So we actually did a clinical trials and here the chips were implanted in patients. Uh, there, I'll go over what they were used for in a minute. Uh, and there, you can communicate with them over a special radio frequency called the Medical Implant Communication Service Band, which is approved by two federal agencies. And you can actually have a special computer code uh, that if you want to change things. 
and 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 by, and and it's also encrypted, so people can't uh, hack it very easily. And in fact, the person who did that uh, was in charge of the air-to-ground missile before she did this, uh, and she said ours is much better. Uh, there's also a bi-directional communications link between the chip and the receiver. By the way, the receiver could just be like an iPhone or something like that, and it, or, or you know, or some other device that gives you all kinds of information, like did you take the drug, battery life, and so forth. Next slide. So I mentioned to you, we, we actually wanted to use this to solve a medical problem. So we wanted to pick something where it would really make a difference. And the one we picked was osteoporosis. This is a disease that often older women have. And one of the main treatments is to inject what's called parathyroid hormone once a day. Now, you, in this case, you don't want continuous release. Continuous release can cause bone resorption. So you don't want that. You want pulsatile release. You want an injection once a day. But people don't want to inject themselves once a day. Here, you don't have to. Here, you could uh, hopefully do better, as I'll show you. So basically, the, not only do they not want to do it, it turns out that 75% of the time, they don't do it. Uh, but in our case, what we did, and this was done in Holland, there was a small office procedure to do the implant. And these got the same pharmacokinetics with less variability, actually, than the injections. And there are three measures, calcium, PINP, and CTX, uh, that showed the same measures as daily injections. Next slide. And I'll just show you some clinical data here. The top graph shows you the amount, and this is in human beings, the levels of, of parathyroid hormones in people at days 60, 68, uh, 76 and 84, and they're pretty much identical. The bottom pictures on the right show you pictures of the chip. We've actually made the chips much smaller now, but you do see that you get fibrous tissue, not much, but some. But histologically, when you look on the left, there are no inflammatory cells at all. So it's very, very minor. And obviously, even the little bit of encapsulation doesn't stop the drug from coming out. So this is one thing you might do. But Ali Jonas uh, working with us, uh, we actually had a, a different idea. Many of you have probably heard of the idea of personalized medicine. And in the case of cancer, one of the strategies that's been used is to take cancer, if a patient has cancer, is to biopsy the patient's cancer cells and, and, and take them out of the body and then test them against the battery of different anti-cancer drugs. And you find out which one's the best and then you actually use that on the patient. And that's an that's a, a interesting method, but it suffers from a few drawbacks, right? One, if you do it in vitro, you don't have extracellular matrix. You don't have the blood vessels. And maybe most importantly, you don't have the immune system. So we thought rather than do what everybody else did, which was take the cancer cells and bring them to the lab, what if we brought the lab into the patient? And the way we would do that is by changing this chip design. What we do now is make a little cylindrical device that you could put in through human biopsy mute. You say in the case here, we're looking at say breast cancer, you inject it, uh, a few of these into the, uh, in, into the tumor. Uh, and, and then if you look in the second panel, uh, maybe we have 30 or 40 different microdoses in different places, they're all delivered out. Then you come back, and by the way, this is a, a 19 gauge needle that we injected in. Then you come back with a slightly bigger needle that takes out the device in a tiny bit of surrounding tissue. And we look at the surrounding tissue and judge apoptosis. And we could see which drugs really work. And you get this readout in the final point showing you really within 24 hours, what drugs work best, not in vitro, but in the patient themselves. Next slide. And this just shows a picture of how tiny these are, they can be injected, like I say, through a tiny needle. Uh, you could put 30 or more drugs, probably 100 drugs in combination. You get an answer in a day or two. It's minimally invasive, and there's no systemic exposure to these drugs. You're actually giving a millionth of the systemic dose. And just to show you how the drugs come out over 24 hours, next slide. You, could, you space these far enough apart in the, in the implant so that there's no overlap. And you can look at what happens by multi mass spec or fluorescence and you see them coming out. Well, does it work? Does it correlate? And the final slide 
I want to show you. And we've done this in many different animal models. And now it's actually in multiple human clinical trials at different hospitals in the United States. But here we take six drugs or five drugs in a control and a triple negative breast cancer model. And if you look at the systemic results, you get exactly the same trends as you get in the device results on the left. Device is left, systemic is right. So exactly the same trends. So if you do the device system, it actually will tell you what works the best. And that seems to be happening also from the little that we've started on the various clinical trials in patients. So thank you very much for listening to me. I, I, I've been trying to go over some of the things that one might do with nano and micro technology. There are many, many other things as well. Um, and and uh, really it's an honor to be able to present this lecture to you um, this morning and at your time. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Bob, for wonderful, <laughs> inspiring and um, the most informative, uh, exciting uh, lecture. That, um, I'm sure there will be many uh, uh, questions. We've got 10 minutes to share. Uh, I uh, have uh, Dr. Um, Jenny uh, Lam, uh, who raised a, uh, uh, a question. Uh, sure. Are you there, uh, Jenny, uh, that you could um, uh, uh, unmute? Let me see. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. You can, you can talk. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Langer, for the very uh, wonderful talk. And uh, I have a question about uh, the delivery of RNA, because we know that the lipid nanoparticles uh, appear to be the most successful way to deliver RNA because of the uh, participant and also the M messenger RNA vaccine. And there has been a lot of interest in um, now because of the COVID, people trying to deliver the RNA into the lung. So I just want to see what's your opinions about using lipid nanoparticles to also deliver RNA to the lungs, or you sort of think other delivery system like polymer may be a better choice for that purpose. Thank you. Well, I think both are viable approaches. You know, I mean, Moderna has a program. This is public information with Vertex on delivery to the lung. Uh, and and uh, I think you could do it. I think I think both are, I think a lot may depend on what, what you're trying to get at in the lung as to what would be the best way to go. But I, I think both, uh, you know, just to go over different places, if you look at all the different messenger RNA companies, People are looking at lipid nanoparticles, polymer nanoparticles, micelles, you know, and there may be other things that people will use at different points in time, depending on the goal. But I mean, lipid nanoparticles certainly, you know, for the things that we've done so far, not the long, have, have, have worked out very well. But I, I, I think there is the possibility, uh, there, each has a, a certain advantages and disadvantages. Polymer ones and possibly micelles might have some advantages from a storage standpoint. But from an efficacy standpoint right now, uh, the lipid nanoparticles have been, have been very useful for, for many of the things we've done. Uh, I've got the Min Chen uh, 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 question, and then there will be uh, three others uh, uh, to sure. follow. Min, uh, would you like to speak? Yeah, thank you so much, Bob, for your wonderful talk. So I guess that currently there are like the uh, US President Biden was saying like you're probably uh, the vaccine patent waiver so could you share some of your comments? Thanks. Well, sure. Well, what I mean, first of all, Moderna, we announced eight months ago that, um, you know, we weren't gonna enforce any of our patents during COVID. So, I mean, from the Moderna standpoint, that doesn't even matter. I mean, I don't see that, um, I don't see any, you know, like I say, our intent was to, if somebody wanted to use uh, our patents, that they would and we would not uh, do anything about it. That being said, I don't think patents are the key issue. I, I think that the key issue is manufacturing. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, you can make patents available, but, and I didn't even get into that, but, you know, one of the other people in our lab, Rohit Karnick, 
Uh, one of the things we did with polymers and then later lipids is introduce this whole idea of microfluidic mixing. And that's the way pretty much all these nanoparticles are made today. But it is not simple. Uh, you know, the, the, it, it, it's not a simple procedure. It's certainly amenable to scale up uh, and, and so forth. But there's, you know, multiple, um, you know, you, you, you have multiple, um, uh, what should I say, uh, paths have to connect it just in just the right way at just the right time, because you have uh, the lipids in one place and the drug in another place. So they're not simple and they're not really patented. And you have to have very experienced people doing the manufacturing. You know, it, it, so like even in the United States, uh, the FDA shut down one of the top, or at least everybody thought, a top manufacturing place in Baltimore. And the United States has very good quality control measures and a very strong FDA. So I, I am concerned that just giving the patents, I don't think it does really very much for anybody. Um, you know, I think that basically, you know, the manufacturing issue is really key. And, and unless people have a big manufacturing plant uh, and, and really experienced people doing it, 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 it it's, it's not gonna lead to anything. In fact, my bigger fear is by doing that, you could, create, you could end up having people trying to manufacture it, not have good quality control and, um, you know, and, and, and lead to real safety issues. So I, I anyhow, so I could go on further. I think there are other reasons for not doing the waiver just in terms of decreasing uh, innovation. You might've seen that Angela Merkel uh, was very much opposed to this in Germany, uh, but, uh, but, but fundamentally to me, to Moderna, it makes, like I said, our, our plan all along. And like I say, this isn't, I'm not saying this today, it, we, we said it eight months ago, you know, people are welcome to use our patents and if, if they want, and they were welcome to use it eight months ago before, you know, Biden said anything. Thank you. Uh, I've got uh, five more questions. So if, sure. uh, if Bob, if you uh, can okay. stay on for another yep. no, five, no. Uh, 10 minutes, uh, I probably will have to close the uh, <laughs> the question time after this. I've, I've seen, well, actually, as I speak, there are six uh, in the queue already. Uh, so uh, at some point, I will have to um, uh, <laughs> make a cut. Uh, but uh, Larry goes uh, first. Larry Baum. Larry. Uh, are you there, uh, Larry? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. It's really fascinating work you've presented. And you talked about how you faced many obstacles early in your career, uh, not only technical, but also from, from senior people. Do you have any advice for young scientists how they can overcome these kind of obstacles? Yeah, I think it's not easy. I mean, you just have to hang in there. I do think, you know, I mean, again, you could do one of two things. Either you could do more, what should I say, less risky work and you probably won't have those obstacles, but I don't know that you'll have a, you know, you'll, I don't know that you'll feel as good about your career. You know, I think you could, you hopefully you get mentors. I mean, I, for me, my mentors were some of my young colleagues, like I mentioned, Mike Marletta and also Alex Klebanov. I think having good mentors would probably be the best way, but it's, you know, it's hard to necessarily, it's hard to find good mentors sometimes. Great, uh, uh, but you're one of the great mentors. And uh, next we have Yi Wu. Hi, Bob, uh, this is Yi Wu. Uh, uh, good to see you again. Uh, we had uh, some interaction while I was at the Gates Foundation. Uh, we were working on your uh, Ominosat project. Uh, uh, Bill Gates was uh, really fond of you. Every time we have issues, he said, ask Bob. So it's good to hear your talk again. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, you know, do you have any thoughts around the, uh, uh, um, um, having technology to deliver large molecular across uh, uh, blood berry, uh, brain blood berry, uh, as we are more and more getting into uh, the situation that we needed to adjust some psychological, mental, neurological diseases? Yeah, well, I think it's a great question. I mean, by the way, Bill Gates has been wonderful to us. I mean, probably close to half the lab is working on, on new kinds of medicine and nutrition for the developing world. 
Uh, the blood brain barrier thing, well, we're, I mean, I don't have a great answer for you. Uh, there are a number of companies working on it. Our cells, you know, I've been advising some companies that are looking into, for example, exosomes as a possible way to do it. I think the key issue is what type of bioavailability are you going to get? And this is sufficient. We've also been working on with uh, Li Wei Sai at, on, uh, at MIT, uh, who's head of the Pickauer Institute, on trying to create brains on a chip. Uh, and trying to use that where we might be able to do high throughput screening of different kinds of approaches. So, you know, so that, that, that type of approach may also be helpful to have a, a brain on a chip someday. Great. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next we have uh, uh, Ying Li. Uh, yes. Thank you uh, very much for allowing me to ask a question. I'm just curious about the device that you mentioned in, uh, at the last of your talk. I'm wondering if it needs to be like surgically inserted into the core of the tumor and then after the analysis and need to be surgically take out. Yes, well, it's not taken in, I, I, I suppose you could say surgically. You use a biopsy needle to put it in and you use a slightly bigger needle to take it out. Okay, got it. So it's like minimize the like damage to the tissue site or others. Right. I mean, you might go in anyhow with a biopsy needle. So it's it's a relatively small, like I say, 19 gauge needle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got it. Thanks. Uh, so next uh, we have uh, Li Chen Gao. Li Chen. Uh, are you there? Uh, okay, well then, uh, if you're not yet. Uh, Yan Qing. Oh, hello, I'm here. Oh, right, okay, right. So okay. Please. Yeah, okay. So, uh, very thank you to Professor uh, Langer yeah, for your awesome talk. So my, uh, I have learned a lot from your yeah, uh, presentation. So my question uh, is, uh, in one of your slides, you mentioned that multiple drugs can be used together to treat the disease. Uh, so my uh, question is, uh, th this idea actually is quite interesting and uh, to me, and I think it's very good. So in your opinion, so what's the best challenge to 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 perform this uh, strategy to cure the can to cure the disease to exert the exert the synergistic effects such as uh, how to handle the side effects of so many drugs how to choose different drugs and uh, etc. So can you share your comments? Thanks. Sure. I don't know that there's any one way to do it. I mean, we're creating tools like the microchip where you could do that, uh, and and. Um, there's also cell therapies where you might be able to do it. But I think you have to look at what disease you're trying to treat, how many drugs, are there some that are better than others for that particular disease and, and so forth. So I, I don't know the, so I think we basically have the tools. You still have to figure out what the right drugs were. Uh, and, and that might be done by some of the approaches that I mentioned on the very last slide. Okay. Um. This is also the same question that Ming, Ming Yan was uh, asking. Uh, I will next have a fairly broad question from Jen, uh, Jen Hai. Uh, okay, thank you. Mm. Uh, right. Uh, so, uh, Jen Hai Liu, are you, you, can you, Yeah, uh, I have to unmute you. Uh, yeah. Um, Jen Hai. Jen, Jen Hai. Hey, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lang, for your nice presentation. Actually, I would like to ask a very broad question. I, I, actually, I've heard a lot of uh, stories from you too balance the uh, research and uh, different kind of research, including scientific ones and the translational ones. I just think that uh, since we are really developing the, uh, the, the very applicable research, say the industrial research, as well as the real scientific research. So how can you balance this? And 
uh, while, while uh, doing you know, really cutting edge stuff, but uh, still public, uh, uh, publishing school papers, but still uh, starting up many companies, how can you balance all of this kind of stuff seems very challenging. Thanks. Well, MIT has a good environment for doing that. I mean, we do the basic, more basic research in the lab, but when it gets to a certain point where you aren't that far away from clinical trials or, and where you might want to have some manufacturing facility, you know, having a company, I mean, we couldn't do those things, clinical trials or manufacturing at MIT. So having a company do it, I think gives you the opportunity to move it forward. And I point out like a lot of the students who have worked on this, you know, they, they might have worked on something for 45, six years, and they really want to see the amazing careers they've done lead to products. So starting a company is something that they want to do. So we kind of look at things on a case-by-case case by case basis that way, too. Uh, thanks, Bob, uh, for um, staying with us. I've got two last questions that I will allow. Uh, one uh, is from Aya. Uh, uh, Lali, I uh, hope I pronounced your name correctly. Are you there? Yes, I am. Um, thank you very much, actually, Professor Langer, such a great talk. Um, I guess my question from a medical oncology perspective is that you presented quite nicely that microchip where you can check, you can identify different drugs and drug responses in a personalized approach. However, when you look at the immu immuno-oncology arena, where do you actually, can you actually fit the mRNA technology in that personalized approach rather than selecting TAAs or uh, neoantigens that are um, generally available in that specific cancer type to identify um, that, that same patient's um, TAAs or neoantigens and generate a series of mRNAs in a chip form um, to see whether or not patients respond to those. Yeah, well, I think in the case of mRNA, I mean, actually Moderna is doing that. We're working with Merck on those things. And Genentech, I believe, is also working on that. Uh, we're not using chips in those cases, but we are looking at the uh, patient's, uh, you know, we are looking at the patient's genetic composition and then maybe making, you know, 24 or 36 different messenger RNAs in all in lipid nanoparticles that uh, we might, in, you know, inject to the patient. So that's another way of thinking about it. So I think there's different strategies depending on whether you use messenger RNA which is much more complicated to deliver than small molecules. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. So um, the last question, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, from KM. Uh, hmm? KM. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, thanks for the uh, I'm such a nice presentation. And I'm just wondering, because when whenever we ingest something into the bloodstream, it all, most all goes um, to the liver and the kidney. So I'm just wondering if there is any um, strategy that you can specifically deliver your liver, um, lipid molecules to the um, specific organs, like a heart? Yeah, well, I think that's a great question. And as I mentioned in the talk, one of the challenges is delivery to different cell types. I think right now, you know, we've been able to uh, develop ways to deliver drugs and others too have done this to, um, you know, to endothelium, to immune cells, to the liver. I don't know that there's, other than physical placement, whether anybody's come up with a good way to deliver things to the heart. I think there may be some high throughput screening approaches uh, that might be used, but, uh, but I don't know of a good targeting molecule to the heart. I do think you could place things physically, you know, in a blood vessel. I mean, you know, that's what a stent yeah. does that. But I mean, having something all of a sudden find its way to the heart in no other place, I've not seen that done, but I could envision it being done someday, perhaps by you know having some type of library approach like phage display or or, or materials that that you know and, and having some type of high throughput right. uh, you know cell assay. You know, we've also one of the some of my students have also developed the heart on a chip, so mm -hmm. that uh, you might be able to use something like that for what you're asking. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, thanks. Um, uh, Bob has said that uh, you've been very patient with us. I said that I would close the have to close the Q and A session, but I, I actually there's a, a pretty uh, a good uh, question also to uh, end the session on from um, uh, from 
generally about uh, how did you balance the scientific research and translation the ones in your lab? Yeah, well, basically we do both and I kind of give my students a choice of, you know, like, like they can work on anything. I mean, uh, that, I mean, I just want them to have a good research experience. Some are more interested in doing, you know, basic stuff. Others are more, a bit more interested in translational stuff. So we, we probably do about half and half in the lab and it's, but it's really, I, I just want the students to hopefully choose something that they enjoy. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for sharing your insights uh, uh, with us. Uh, not only uh, did we have a, a great lecture, uh, the Q&A uh, was also very um, uh, inspirational, uh, the um, inspiring, the, um, uh, it, and it covers uh, broad issues like mentoring and how to balance uh, uh, different aspects of uh, discoveries and academic demands uh, uh, all the way to uh, more specific uh, uh, frontier research uh, uh, with chips uh, uh, everywhere in the, in the body, uh, not only for cancer, but even possibly in future for the brain and the heart. So uh, we can envisage that um, uh, health isn't not going to be the same uh, with uh, uh, Bob's uh, 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 drive in, uh, uh, in his desire to help people. That is what, what you started uh, wanting to do. And um, we admire how much you have achieved, but know that uh, uh, you're not stopping at all. You are, if, any, if anything, uh, it, will, uh, it is accelerating and uh, if we have a chance to invite you for another talk and hopefully um, uh, uh, this time we'll be in person. Uh, Max will probably introduce you uh, with an, an H index of a thousand or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. we'll, we'll see how we do. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, uh, but thanks again. Uh, uh, Bob for the wonderful uh, lecture. And I'd li also like to thank all the participants for uh, uh, bearing uh, with me. Uh, I think you've enjoyed a great talk, but um, uh, if uh, we have any technical hitch, uh, my apologies. Uh, the uh, Lee Center is very proud to have uh, been associated with this uh, wonderful occasion. Thank you, Bob, once again.